Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I believe that God is with us. I'm thankful to be here again, to be able to get into his word, and to continue uh, with our series, our School of the Prophets. Um, I believe that God has something very, very special for us to all learn and understand throughout these classes that we'll be having. And I believe that the enemy wants us to miss essential points. He desperately wants us to miss many of the essential points that we're going to be looking at because he knows that if we get a hold of it, that we will be prepared to face him and everything that he has that he's going to throw our way. But the Bible lets us know, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So there's many things that we need to learn about him that is in us. Many things that we need to learn about Christ in order that we may make adequate preparation for what's getting ready to come before us. It's so easy, for me at least, and it's probably the same from Brother Paul being that we're coming from New York. Uh, we see how it looks out there, but when we come here to another country, uh, uh, like Guyana, or if we go to any other Caribbean island, every, like this is like a, a, a paradise of sorts. Mango trees here and there, palm trees, the sun, the weather's feeling good. We have things like snow and whatnot. So, so to us, you know, in coming here, it, it just feels good. And it's easy for us to become lukewarm and lackadaisical in seeing the beauty of nature and of the greenery and things of that nature. But God doesn't want us to get lost in, in, in the comfort of our surrounding and of how things look nice and how things look, you know, comfortable. Uh, we, because we we're told that people would be preaching about peace and safety. And that, uh, and even if you don't hear people preaching peace and safety, it might look like outside there is peace and safety. But there is a storm that is coming. A serious storm that is coming. And it behooves us to know the truth as it is in Jesus. And, and when we're talking about the truth as it is in Christ, it is speaking about the gospel in Christ, as Brother Paul has been preaching, and also the gospel that Christ has been preaching, meaning the prophecies that he's been speaking about, and realizing the time that we're living in. It is very important to know the time. As a matter of fact, doesn't the Bible say, and that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, because our salvation is nearer than when we first believe. That's Romans chapter 13, verse 11. And so we need to know the time. And so that's why we're, we're spending our time in the 14th chapter of the Revelation. Now before we continue moving forward in it, let us kneel to have a word of prayer. Our Father, our God, which art in heaven, we again thank you for your love, your grace, your marvelous grace, your grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Lord, we're ever so thankful for that grace. That you who are rich became poor so that through your poverty we may be rich. Lord, we thank you for your riches so that we may recognize the riches, the rich gifts that you have given to us in this place. And that we may take full advantage of those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, as we saw from yesterday, our, our studies are thorough and they are intense. And this is not going to change. Uh, what's getting ready to come is going to come with great intensity as well. And we're going to need to fortify our minds with the scriptures. Our, the scriptures are our only safeguard. And so if we can't walk with the footmen, how are we going to run with the horsemen? All right? So, so, so know that we're going to continue with the intensity, and it is only going to get greater and greater. The loud cry, it swells. It swells. It only swells and increases in intensity. And I heard a man say, 
and I read in a book too also, that, that the loud cry is more demonstration than noise. But the only way that that demonstration can be fulfilled in, in the fullness of its manifestation is if we are intensely imbued and filled and we have the Word of God properly inculcated in our mind, in our spirits. Okay? Our spirit needs to be so united with the Holy Spirit of God. And we receive the Spirit of God through His Word, through intense prayer, a longing after Him. So we will see that when we look at the 14th chapter of the Revelation, that God's people, as we saw historic truth, present truth, and prophetic truth, they have the experience that prepares them for the end. So what I want us to do is to look at Revelation chapter 14. Let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. All right, I'm going to run through what we saw yesterday, and then we're going to focus in on the final movements. That is the fifth, the sixth, and if we have time, maybe the seventh. So Revelation chapter 14. If we're there, let's say amen. All right, Revelation chapter 14. Now notice your screen, the screen. Uh, we saw this yesterday. In regards to the 14th chapter of the Revelation, it said that it would soon be understood. The 14th chapter of Revelation is a chapter of the deepest interest. This scripture will soon be understood in how much of its bearings? All of its bearings. And the messages given to John the Revelator will be repeated with distinct utterance. And this is what's going on right now. If not now, then when? If not now, then when? So we're not here to merely study prophecy, that this is what's going to happen. No, no. This is what is happening. You see me? This is what is happening. So when Brother Paul yesterday is talking about the eclipse is over, it's not going to be over. No, we have the right to declare right now that the eclipse is over. Do you want it? Is that your desire for the eclipse to be over? So, 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 so when we're studying prophecy, it's not, we're not looking at it in the sense, we need to stop looking at it in the sense of this is what's going to happen. No, no, this is what's going on right now. That present truth, that, that, that the 14th chapter of Revelation, this scripture will, will be understood now. Okay, this was 60 years ago that she said it will soon be understood. Soon is now. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. It, it is understood now. It will be understood now in all of its bearings. And the messages given to John the Revelator will be repeated. It's being repeated now in distinct utterance. I choose for this to be so. Choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. How long are we going to halt between two opinions? Revelation chapter 14, and I will read through it. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of waters. 
And there followed another angel. This is the second angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead, or in, not on, but in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image. And whoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Continuing to read, it doesn't stop there. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, save the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat unto like the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel followed out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the clouds thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the, came out from the, all right, came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud, vo loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angels thrust in his sickle unto the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden where? Without the city. And blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse brittles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. What we just read is so significant. And when the Lord was teaching me this as I was reading through books of reformers, through books, through the Bible, and studying and learning from other individuals, standing on their shoulders. The Lord opened much understanding. And I gotta, and I'll tell you straight, I don't understand everything that's going on in here. But what I do understand is what I've been commissioned to share. And from there, iron sharpeneth iron. So what I don't see, and you may see, when we come together and we study, we come to a greater knowledge of the truth. So we saw yesterday the first, the second, and the third angels movement, and the fourth. And we saw that there are seven angels in Revelation chapter 14, right? Now, each angel represents a movement. So seven angels, seven movements. Important for us to see them all and understand it all, because if we do not, then we will be making inadequate preparation to be able to stand in the position that has been divinely ordained for us. Do you believe that God actually wants you to be a part of the 140 and 4,000? God didn't train Daniel so that he can just be some other guy. God didn't train the three Hebrew worthies so that they can just be out and about. He is teaching us and training us right now so that we can be in that movement, each of us in this place right now. And so we saw, with the, we saw that there were seven angels, seven movements. So we already saw that the first angel's movement began with William Miller. Our object is not to go deep into the details of each of the movements. 
Our object is simply to look at the broad scope, the bird's eye view of the seven angels, the seven movements, and then zoom into exactly where we are. Okay, so our object, we didn't, we, we didn't go thoroughly into it all. That's not our object. Our object is just to look at the seven in a sweep and then zero into where we are and what we are to do. And to realize that with the first angel's movement, right, it wasn't able to finish the work. Theirs was to begin it, to move on to the second angel's movement with Charles Fitch, S.S. Snow, and other pioneers that were calling them out of Babylon, right? And then the third angel's movement with Hiram Edson and Oral Kreuzer, realizing that the sanctuary was not on earth but in heaven, Christ moving from the holy to the most holy place. They had a chance to learn that after suffering the great disappointment. And then after that, there is the fourth angel's movement, which God start, sought to really get started with A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. But there was much resistance by the Seventh-day Adventist leadership of that time to that message, that most precious message. Sister White said of that message that I, I have never heard words like this other than the conversations that I've had with my husband. And when I heard another man say it, I was pleased. She said that when I heard another present those thoughts, every fiber of my heart said amen. It was a riveting thing for her to see that there were people that were understanding this truth, this light of justification by faith, Christ our righteousness. She saw that that was the message that if we would accept it in its fullness, the work would have been wrapped up in two years. Meaning there certainly would not have been a 21st century. We would not be here. But here we are. We need to understand what was going on back then. But what I want us to grasp is this right here. That's the fourth angel. And we saw the fourth angel in Revelation chapter 18, but we also saw it in Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at it again. Revelation chapter 14. From verse 14, Jesus is the fourth angel. Jesus is not a created angel. He is the creator of all angels. Colossians chapter 1 and chapter 2 explains that all things were created by him and for him. He is not a created being. He is the creator of all things that exist. And he is the reason as to why they consist. All right. So, so, so Jesus is this angel of the Lord, and he is described in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. He says, and I looked and behold, a white cloud. The cloud represents the angels. Right. And we noted that yesterday from Psalms 104 and verse 3 and Psalm 68 as well. So the white cloud, the angels, and upon the cloud, one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. He is this fourth angel right over here. White cloud, when you see clouds, what is getting ready to come? Rain. Hey, hey, hey. Say that one more time. When you see clouds, what is getting ready to come? Rain. Even the latter rain. So right here, we're looking at the latter rain. Jesus is being uplifted by this movement over here. Jesus is, 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 is in his people. And these people are experiencing an increase of angelic activities in their life. Jesus did not do one miracle of his own power when he was here on this world. He did it through the angels. You can read that in the book, Desire of Ages. It was through the angels that he accomplished his miracles. So right here, this angel represents Jesus. It is Jesus. It doesn't just merely represent. It is Jesus. And it is also you and I because we are all in him. Wherever he is, that is where we are. Whatever he is doing, that is what we are doing. So when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, he didn't say Paul is crucified with Christ. He said, I, so that anyone who reads it can be inspired with confidence to know that, oh, this is me that is crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it is not I, but it is 
Christ, which does what? Liveth in me and the life which I now live. So now, new life, because they realize that Christ did something for them before they even asked. Now that I live, it is not I, but it is Christ that lives in me, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the fourth angel right here represents Jesus right here. He has the sharp sickle in his hand, which represents the cleaver of truth. The first, the second, and the third angel's message. So the fourth angel is the loud cry of the third angel. The fourth angel uh, 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 controls, ha has full control of the third angel's message. One, two, and three. Okay? So this cleaver in his hand, or this sickle with the gardening object lesson, represents the three angels' message, right? And that is the final message to the world. Meaning, what this means is that after this, no more probation. Probation is close. This is the final message. This is the last ray of merciful light. This is the last message of mercy to the world, which is the revelation of God's character of love. This is the final one right here. So all this already? The movement symbolized by the angel coming down from heaven, lightening the earth with his glory, crying with a loud voice. This is showing us that this is uh, 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 the fourth angel, Jesus Christ, through us, lightening this entire world. This is the fourth angel's movement. It is a movement which consists of those from the third angel's movement and the sheep that are not of this fold. Because they hear, come out of Babylon, they hear the voice of Jesus, and they come into one fold. We saw that in John chapter 10. We saw this where we just talked about this, the first, second, and third angels uh, separated from the church uh, to a nearness to Christ by the mighty cleaver of truth. Okay, so we saw that already. Now, we move to the fifth angel. Now we intensify. We move to the fifth angel right now. Let's read of the fifth angel in Revelation 14 and verse 15. And another angel came out of where? The temple. Very important to see that. The fifth angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. The harvest of the earth is ripe, meaning it is ready. It is prepared. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The earth was reaped. Who is this angel speaking to? The one that sits on the cloud, right? So, so this angel is not giving a message to the world. The first three angels, the first four, pardon me, angels were speaking to the world. But this angel has no more message to the world. So what this is showing is that this is the close of probation. Probation is closed right here. This angel is speaking to Christ alone. This angel is only looking unto Jesus. And that's it. This is a statement from Desire of Ages on page 302 in paragraph 1. It says that the Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul that is looking unto Jesus. He takes of the things of Christ and presents them unto him. If the eye is kept fixed on Christ, then the work of the Spirit ceases not until the soul is conformed into his image. That's Desire of Ages, page 302 in paragraph 1. The Holy Spirit never leaves unassisted the soul that is looking unto Jesus. These people are only looking at Jesus. They don't see the persecutors. They don't see the accusers. They only see Jesus and they only are speaking to him. Their life is calling out after Jesus. It says again, another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, speaking to Christ, looking unto Christ, thrust in thy sickle to reap. We are told in the book, Christ's Object Lesson on page 69, that Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself 
in his church. It is when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, it is then that he will come to claim them as his own. It's when his character is perfectly reproduced in his people. So here these people had the character of Jesus perfectly reproduced in them, and they are crying out to him, reap us because we are ripe. Reap us because we are ready for the harvest. Their, their life is shown to Christ that they are ready to be harvested. You know, I have a little garden at home, and I like to grow tomatoes. I like tomatoes a lot. And so one day, I went outside and I saw this one tomato, and the tomato was nice and red and plump, and it was looking so juicy and proper. So I'm looking at this tomato, and this tomato was crying out to me and saying, harvest me, because I am ripe for the harvest. I am ready to be reaped. Now if that tomato is green, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna pick it. I know some people like to make fried green tomatoes. Uh, you know, it's all right, but you know, I like the red tomatoes because it is ready for harvest. So that's what's going on right here. These people are ready to be harvested and they are calling out on Jesus on the clouds saying, reap us, reap us from the earth because we are ready for the harvest. Now I move on. Notice these statements with me. Zyre Vegas, ooh, 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 ooh. before I get to that one. Before I get to that, Christ is going to reap them from the earth, right? Christ is going to reap them from the earth. Right before I bring up that statement, I just want to make that point right here. That we read in verse 16 that he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now that's not necessarily speaking about bringing them to heaven. It's saying that the, because there's, another, there's a sixth angel too. It's saying that they were reaped from the earth. What does that mean? They have already attained victory over sin by the grace of Jesus Christ. Because this is, probation has been closed. They have no message for the world. So they are sealed. Amen? They are sealed. So they already have victory over sin. But there is a further work of cleansing that God continues to do with his people. Okay, And that is not only the cleansing of sin, sinfulness, but also the cleansing of earthliness. Mm -hmm. So the cleansing of earthliness. So now when people look at these people, when the angelic organization and all the unfallen worlds are looking at them, they see that the just indeed shall live by faith. How do we know this? Because they have overcome sinfulness. And now the further work of cleansing of earthliness is being cleansed from them, whereby they are not depending upon themselves at all. They're not depending on anything of this earth at all. And so when it says, as I understand it, when it says that, 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 that Christ, he thrusts in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped, these people are reaped, something is being, they're being cut off from something. Notice in Desire of Ages. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers. They will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will be finally decreed that they shall be put to death. So every earthly support is cut off. And these people, their dependence is 100% on God. Like, perfectly on God. On nothing from this earth. The Lord has shown me word to a little flock. The Lord has shown me in a vision that Jesus rose up and shut the door and entered the Holy of Holies at the seventh month, 1844. So the tenth day of the seventh month, that's the Day of Atonement. So that's what that's talking about. But Michael's standing up Daniel 12 and verse 1, to deliver his people is in the future. It's important to understand this context because it helps you understand, it solidify the context of the fifth angel and the time that the fifth angel is in, after the close of probation. This will not take place until Jesus 
has finished his priestly office in the heavenly sanctuary and lays off his priestly attire and puts on his most kingly robes and crown to ride forth on the cloudy chariot to thrust the heathen in anger and deliver his people. Then Jesus will have the sharp sickle in his hand and then the... And then the saints will cry day and night to Jesus on the cloud to thrust in his sharp sickle and reap. So, 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 so in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 15, it says that it is an angel that says this. It says it's an angel that comes out of the temple and says, thrust in thy sickle. But in inspired writing, where it's a little flat, it says that it is the saints that will cry day and night to Jesus on the cloud to thrust in his sharp sickle and reap. So, 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 th so this is a nail in a sure place. That this angel represents the saints of God living at the time of pro close of probation, calling out for Christ to thrust in the sickle. This is very plain. This is so undeniable. And we thank God for his word and for giving us this clarity that it is the saints that are calling for Christ to harvest because they are ready to be reaped. This will be the time of Jacob's trouble, out of which the saints will be delivered by the voice of God. So that is the time of Jacob's trouble, where the saints will be delivered by the voice of God. So we see clearly, I believe, that this angel represents a movement, the people of God, who have the character of Christ perfectly reproduced in them, and their life is calling for Christ to return. They have a life that calls for Christ to return. Sure. Um, instead of the saints will Yes, yes. Yes. We're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. At, we're going to come to that in the end, actually. So don't you worry. We're going to come to that in the end. But we want to make sure that we lay, we continue building upon the solid foundation. So we're going to come to that. I'm glad that you brought that, that text up. We're going to come to that. Don't you worry. All right? So, okay. So the fifth angel, we see this. They're calling for Christ to do the work. Now, remember how we had said because now we're moving into the sixth angel. Remember how we said that the final movements will be rapid ones. So fifth, sixth, and seventh angel, rapid, rapid. Almost, almost really simultaneous. The fifth and the sixth especially. The fifth angel's movement, are the, the saints had the life that was calling for Christ to reap them as his own for the heavenly harvest. But there are two harvests that go on in the end. There are two harvests. So now we look at the sixth angel. Let's stay in Revelation 14. Let's notice from verse 17 through verse 20. Revelation 14. Okay. And another angel came out of... Oh, oh, before I even get to that. Just another, another, another helpful point. Another helpful point for you to note down with the fifth angel. Where does the fifth angel come out of? The temple. The temple. That's important to note. They came out of the temple. Because if they came out of the temple, then that means that they were in the temple, even in the most holy place. Okay? So that's why it says it came out of the temple. That's representing us having had finished, well, Christ and us being done with the Day of Atonement, well, being done with the, 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 with the cleansing of the sanctuary, in fact, and probation is now closed. Okay, so they're coming out of the temple. So you can note that down and continue to allow that thought to marinate as you continue to personally study this chapter. So now moving into the sixth angel now. Verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple. Isn't that interesting? Came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had the power of over fire. So we see the fifth and the seventh, the sixth rather, and the seventh angel like really close together. Rapid ones, rapid movements. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire. He doesn't come out of the temple, he comes out of the altar. 
and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle. So the seventh angel is crying out to the sixth angel. To him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angels thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Where was the winepress trodden? With, without the city. And blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse brittles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. This angel... All right, so that's that. So this angel, the sixth angel, came out of the temple, just like the fifth did. And then the seventh angel came out of the altar and was crying out to the sixth angel, thrust in thy sharp sickle. Thrust in thy sharp sickle. Why? Because the vines of the earth, those clusters of the vine of the earth, they are also ripe. They are also ripe. So what's going on here? What's going on here? The fifth angel came out of the temple. The sixth angel came out of the temple. What we need to grasp right here is extremely important. That the fifth and the sixth angel are the same people. The fifth and the sixth angel are the same people. They come out of the temple. So they're the same people. What's going on is that John is explaining, as he sees in vision, the fifth angel, it is, it is showing one angle of the people, they have the life of Christ, that is calling for Christ to reap them. But in having that life, that life of Jesus is also a condemnation or a judgment to the world. That's why the sixth angel, when looking at it from the angle of the sixth angel, the sixth angel has a sickle in his hand. The sickle represents judgment. The sickle represents judgment. So this sixth angel has a sickle in his hand because it's the judgment of the world. Their life is a condemnation or a judgment to the world. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. I, I want to show you an example. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, and this is a wonderful text that, ex that you could explain righteousness by faith in this one text. Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll read from, we'll read from verse 6, and it's verse 7 where we want our attention to be. If we're there, let's say amen. All right. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he did what? By the which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. So, so Noah, he, he didn't merely preach the truth, but he lived it. Likewise, the fifth angel's movement, they live the truth. And his life of building the ark, of doing the things of God, of trusting in God, etc., that life, what did that do? It says that he prepared the ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. By the which he condemned the world. So the fifth angel and the sixth angel are the same people as the sixth angel, looking at it from that angle, because they have the life of Christ, that is a condemnation or judgment to the world. That's a judgment to the world. Is that clear? Okay, good. That's it. So it's a judgment to the world. So the fifth angel... And the sixth angel, that's the 144,000. That's the 144,000. The people that make up that, those two movements is the 140 and 4,000. And you're going to see why in a minute. You're going to see why in a minute. So the seventh angel calls out to the sixth angel to reap because the clusters of the bond of the earth, they are ripe. It is ripe. Meaning that they, are, they have the mark of the beast. That's it. 
Because the, the cluster that Christ reaped, they were sealed. They were sealed with the seal of God. But now this cluster over here, those other grapes of the vine of the earth, they have the mark of the beast. And so they're going to suffer the final judgment, which is the seven last plagues. There are two vines. There are two vines. Christ is the true vine. Amen? It speaks about that in the book of John in chapter 15. John chapter 15, I'll read it. You could just jot it down. John 15, where Jesus makes it very plain. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 15. Jesus says these most precious words. He says, I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. Okay, so that's plain right there. You can read from verse 1 through verse 6 and it's thoroughly explained there. That Jesus is the vine. Now those people that he reaped, right, they were connected to him as the vine. And they were connected to him as the vine. And we, the men, are the branches. But now there is another vine. There is another vine, a false vine, another gospel from another man. That other vine is what's being reaped by the sixth angel. It's what's being affected by the life of the sixth angel and by the choices that they have made. Okay? That other vine is the vine of the earth. The Bible calls it the vine of the earth. And the book of Malachi makes it very clear that if you're connected to the vine, the Bible says, For behold, Malachi 4, verse 1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all they that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So, these, so this, 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 fine, this cluster over here, in Revelation chapter 14, the latter part thereof, that the sixth angel or, or reaps or cuts, meaning they suffer the judgment, are those who have been grafted to the vine of the devil. They will, that, that need, it says that the Lord of hosts, they, it shall be left neither root nor branch, Satan being the root and they being the branches. Another text to jot down with that would be Proverbs 2.22. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth and the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. So when we see Revelation 14, it makes it very clear that they are rooted out of the earth. They are cut off from the earth. They are sealed in their decision and they have the mark of the beast. That is the clusters in verse 18 of Revelation 14. That is the clusters of the vine of the earth. So again, the vine of the earth are those who are connected to Satan and have the mark of the beast. They are those who are unconverted and have rejected the salvation of Christ. We know that Jesus, he became us. He came to this earth, and, 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 and in the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 47, it says, the first man is of the earth earthy, the second man is the Lord of heaven. So Christ is not the vine of the earth. He is the vine of the Lord. All right? So when we're looking at this vine of the earth, we have to understand that it's not speaking about Christ. This is speaking about the vine of this earth, the, king of, the, the prince of the power of this earth, those that are connected to him. So the sixth angel, oh yeah, I had, that, I had that text up here also for us to see. The second man is the Lord from heaven. That's important for us to see that. Now it says about these individuals, right? You see that the seventh angel tells them, tells the sixth to reap, to cut them. But we're focusing on the sixth. And then it says what in verse 19? And the angel thrust in his sickle, verse 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So they were cast into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So what is the great winepress of the wrath of God? What is the great winepress of the wrath of God? If you just look up to verse 10, if you just look up to Revelation 14 and verse 10, it speaks about the wine of the wrath of God. 
So the great wine press of the wrath of God, look at what it says. It says, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So now as you're taking note, wine represents blood. Okay? Wine represents blood. We're going to look to understand this. We're going to break this down. Wine represents blood. You could write down Matthew chapter 26, verse 27 to verse 29. Wine represents blood. Jesus was speaking to the disciples, and he, you know, he gave them the wine. He says, drink of it all, drink ye all of it, for it is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And he explains that this is the fruit of the vine. So wine represents blood. Okay, we're looking to understand what is the great wine press of the wrath of God. What is the great wine press of the wrath of God? So we begin with wine representing blood. And so what is blood? Blood, blood, jot down Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. Blood represents life. Blood represents what? Life. In Leviticus 17, 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So we're looking again to understand what is the great wine press of the wrath of God. So we see that the wine represents the blood, and blood represents life. So now we are to understand the wrath of God. Now we are to understand the wrath of God. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 8. You could jot down, note down Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 8. We want to understand what is the wrath of God. Because in the third angel we read a little bit about the wrath of God. And it says that, that it will be poured out without mixture. So this wrath of God, there's no mixture in it. So what exactly does that mean? That this wrath of God is going to be poured out without mixture. What does that mean? Isaiah 54 and verse 8. It says, In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy. Will I have what? Will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. So in a little wrath, in a little wrath, what did God do? What did God do in a little wrath? He hid his face for how long? For a moment. So in a little wrath, he hid his face for a moment. Then it goes on to say, with everlasting kindness, will I have mercy. With everlasting kindness, will I have mercy. So in a little wrath, he hides his face only for a moment. So this little wrath is mixed with mercy. Because only for a moment. Do you see that? This little wrath is mixed with mercy because it's only for a moment that God has done what? Hid his face from thee. Do you understand that if God hides his face from us, trouble comes our way? Lots of trouble comes our way. And it's actually a pretty terrifying thing. That's why the Bible says that his eye is on the sparrow. Because if it's not, then the devil will violently destroy that sparrow. And God cares more about me than some bird. So his eye needs to be on us. So if his face is hidden, then we experience what is called the wrath of God. Now what would happen in his full wrath? If in a little wrath, it's mixed with mercy, then in full wrath, there's no mixture of mercy. No mixture at all with the full wrath. I'll take it at the end. I'll take your question at the end. Is that all right? All right. All right. Yes. Yes. That's right. Yes. On the cross, cried Christ, that cup represented the full wrath of God without mixture. That's what Christ took in. The full wrath of God without 
mixture. What? Sure, exactly. It, there, there we go. You got it. You got it. So that is the hiding of the faith of God, face of God. The full forsake. Now, it's not God that's forsaking us because he says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So if God is no longer with you, it is because you have forsaken him and you experience what's called the wrath of God. So the Bible calls it the wrath of God, but really it's us leaving him and experiencing the lack of his protection. You see, there are benefits, as Paul said, to having God with us. We also saw that our iniquities are what separate us from God. And so these people have chosen to hold on to their iniquity and they are separated from God. So the great wine press of the wrath of God, wine represents blood, blood represents life. So this is the life of these people, the wrath of God, no presence of God. So this is the life of people without the presence of God. Do you understand what kind of things we will do if the presence of God is not in us? Passions would take full sway, and the things that you never thought that you would do, that you will do. When, when, so wrath of God is the absence of the presence of God. And this wine represents the blood, which is the life of these people. This is the life of these people without the presence of God. Do you understand how much destruction will occur with people who have their passions fully loosed? Without the pa a time of trouble such as never was. Nothing can compete with this thing right here. So we see what is the wrath of God. We see what this, the wine of the wrath of God is the life that is no longer under the control of God. So these are Christless people. Without faith, without law, without morals. These people are sealed in their decision and they are like wine. You see, once grapes become, once you get the grape juice, right, and, um, and you keep it contained, it, it becomes fermented, right? It becomes fermented. And fermented wine cannot be reversed to its original state. Fermented wine cannot be reversed to its original state. And so these people are fermented wine. They can irreversible. Their situation is irreversible. That's why the Bible says in Revelation 22 and, ver and verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. So that is the great, that's the wine of the wrath of God. They will remain unjust. They will remain filthy still. So is it clear that probation is closed for these people? These people are, are, have the mark of the beast. This is it for them. So now they're going to suffer the seven last plagues. Seven last plagues. And I want us to understand that the seven last plagues is not an attack from God on this world. The seven last plagues is not the attack of God upon this world. When we read in Revelation in chapter 7, Revelation chapter 7, you find four angels. And these four angels, they, uh, you know, one cries out to them and says, Hold, hold, hold. Do not let loose the four winds, or else it will hurt the earth and the trees and the things on this earth. Do not let loose. But once these winds are let loose, Meaning once God is no longer present, once his spirit is no longer there, then that is the wrath of God. Because everything is out of his control. God is not a God of confusion. When God is controlling something, you find perfect order. But now when the four winds are let loose, you find everything in chaos and out of order. It is the seven last plagues, which is the wrath of God. Let's go to Revelation 15. I want you to read that. I want you to see that from there. 
Revelation 15. It says it right there in verse 1. It says it right there in verse 1. Revelation chapter 15. In verse 1 it says, And I saw another angel. Uh, pardon me, I'm so used to saying that. I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. So the seven angels have the seven vials, and in those bowls are, you find the wrath of God, which came from the great wine press of the wrath of God. Okay? So it's all connected. It's all connected. So during that time of great destruction, during that time, the Bible lets us know a few things. Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah 25, it says, A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. Did we see yesterday the importance of studying the Bible properly? And we saw with Saul that in one place it says that, it says that the Lord slew Saul. But then in the other place it said that the Lord, that, that what happened? That, so, that Saul threw himself on his sword. So here we read that the wicked, that, 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 that he will give them that are wicked to the sword. So God is not throwing the seven last plague on these people, but he has given them up to what they have chosen. They have chosen for, they have chosen for him to leave them alone. And their case is that there is no remedy. No remedy for them. And so they suffer the fullness of the wrath of God. There's a couple of texts. I'm not going to spend much time here because I want, I'm going to go for 10 more minutes with you all. And then we'll take a break. Just a few more texts that you could jot down if you haven't before on the wrath of God. To understand it. Isaiah 55 verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are, your, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So understand, when we speak of the wrath of God, it's completely different than ours. Completely. Psalm 50 and verse 21, These things thou, ha thou hast done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. We think that God is like us. We say, oh, God has wrath, I have wrath too. God gets angry, I get angry too. Where do you get that from? God does not get angry the way that we do. His anger, is, his anger is completely different than ours. When we get mad, we look to destroy people. And we have our method of doing that. God does not operate like man. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. The wrath of God is righteousness. And righteousness is love. And in love there is free will and there is respect of the decision of the other. God is not going to knock his bride over the head and drag her to the altar and force her to marry him. He's not going to do that. He will allow her to make the decision. And if she chooses, I want nothing to do with you, O oh God, then he will respect that decision. And all the responsibilities that he has towards her he gives it up to the God of her choice. That's why it says, that's why the, the, in the Ten Commandments it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's not because God is some ego, maniacal, like desperate for attention, you must worship me. God, love seeketh not her own. Love doesn't even fight for her rights. She doesn't even look for it. Love deserves rightfully everything, but love doesn't even look for it. And so God, quick example, remember the children of Israel when they walked through the, the Red Sea? They walked through the Red Sea on foot. They walked by faith through the Red Sea. Their faith was in God. God's responsibility is to keep them through the Red Sea. Now when these Egyptians are running through the Red Sea, did they have faith in God? Their faith was in their gods. So God has to respect their decision. And he was very sad about this, by the way, because he loved those Egyptians just as much as he loved the children of Israel. You know that, right? God has to respect their decision and give up his responsibility of keeping them safe 
within the waters, and he gives up that responsibility to their gods. So now their gods, if it's a goat, then the goat has to do it. If it's some Dagon, the fish gods, then he has to give up that, that, that responsibility that is his to those gods. And those gods are responsible for the life of those people. Did, the, did those gods keep up the waters? You see, when we serve the devil, he will make sure that we die in our sins. He will make sure that we die in our sins. Because it's not like these Egyptians were crazy. They were in those esoteric, uh, uh, occult uh, religions. So they saw things, okay? Surely they saw things. So, so they're believing what they see. And they're seeing demons, and they're seeing all these things. So they trust in those things because they see it. But our faith is not merely based off what we see, but based off what we experience with Christ. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't need to see something to believe it. Because things that are real leave evidence, but things that are not real cannot leave evidence. And so our faith is based on evidence of the work of God. So them, they're believing what they're seeing, so they're going through this thing, they're thinking that they're going to be all right. Their God's made sure they died in that water. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We have to understand how God works, how he operates. God is love. His righteousness is love. His wrath is love. His wrath is love. Psalms 89 and verse 46. How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Oh, wait, look at that. You see that? So God's hiding is called his wrath. And that wrath, what did it do? It burns like fire. Are there going to be fires in the, in, in the end? Oh, yes. This earth, the Bible says, is going to burn with fervent heat. But there's a dual application to that. There's a physical fire, but there's also the spiritual fire, which is the wrath of God. That separation from God from the minds of men. And when God is no longer in the minds of men, they will go crazy. They will go insane, be overwhelmed with depression, be overwhelmed with the fear, because man's heart shall fail for fear. Proverbs 25, verse 21, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. So the Lord, this, even though those people have cut themselves off from the Lord, he still loves them. He still loves them. And, 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 they, and, they, and they realize that he still loves them in the end because every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. They realize that God loves them. And what is that love going to be like to them? It's going to be like heap coals of fire upon their heads. So they're going to go insane. They're going to be like, I could have accepted this love of Jesus so easily. So easily. But I rejected it, and they just lose their mind because they saw that salvation was so easy, but they had rejected it. That love of God, it's like heaping coals of fire on their head. That's the same thing as the wrath of God. It's God's love. Psalm 27, verse 9, Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. That has been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God, of my salvation. So the psalmist understands that when God is not there, that trouble will come. Lord, by thy favor thou hast made mountains to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. So trouble is there when the face of God is hidden. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like unto them that go down in the pit. Those that die and get buried, hide not thy face from me. Great Controversy, page 36, a wonderful statement here. We cannot, we cannot understand how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason to be grateful for, for gratitude. 
for God's mercy and long suffering and holding in check the cruel, malign power of the evil one. You see, during the destruction of Jerusalem, when you read throughout Great Controversy chapter 1, especially on page 36, from 34 to 37, read that, those pages, you see he explains that, that, that God, those people were unchecked. Passion was loosed. When they ran in to destroy Jerusalem, the leader was actually trying to stop them from doing that. But he had no control over them. No control. And they violently killed every single person that was in there, violently. And not one stone was left upon another. Not one stone. And so that's what happens when God is not in the heart of man. Full and total and utter destruction, violently. And in that time, that's exactly what's going to go on. That is exactly what's going to go on. Why? Because the people realize those pastors, they knew the truth, but they didn't tell it to us. And so they're going to suffer. The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction. But all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things that have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry. I, um, and, and you are the cause of our ruins. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones who, want, who they once admired, them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Everywhere. So that's what's going on it, during, during that time of judgment, during that time of closer probation, during that time of the seven last plagues. People are killing each other left and right. Destruction continues to come, natural disasters, and all, all that stuff. But it gets sweet for the people of God. I want to move. I want to move. Okay, I saw the four angels. We'll hold the, 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 the four winds until Jesus... Four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary, and then will come the seven last plagues. We saw this. These plagues enraged the wicked against the righteous. They thought that uh, we had brought the judgments of God upon them, and that if they could get rid of us on the earth, the plagues would be stayed. A decree went forth to slay the saints, which caused them to cry day and night for deliverance. This was the time of Jacob's trouble. We saw that already. Okay, because they're not only killing each other, but they're seeing the plagues and they're saying, we need to kill these people because they're the reason as to why all this is going on. Okay, that's around the sixth angel. But now in Revelation 14, now I want to jump, I want to jump to the end. We are, if you give me five minutes, we close right here. And I'm actually going to stay true to my word. If you give me five minutes, so it's 11.17, but I don't know how long it's been 11.17. And so I will act as a, okay, it's 11.18 right now, so I will take five minutes from here. So in Revelation chapter 14, in Revelation 14, right, we read that we, we, we went through everything that we went through in regards to what's going on with the destruction, the wrath of God. We needed to understand that with the great Rhine press and all of that. Okay, so you have enough material for, for when you're studying it on your own to rebuild the study and properly grasp everything. But now I want to look at what's going on with the people of God. We saw what happens with them. Now let's look at what happens with the people of God. We are told, we are told in verse 20, that the great wine press was trodden without the city. Outside of the city. That's where the great wine press is trodden, without the city. And blood came out of the wine press even unto the horse brittled by the spaces about 600 furlongs. Okay? So what this is showing us is that the wine press is trodden without the city. There are two cities. There are two cities. So the question is, which city are we talking about? There are two cities. There's Babylon, which is the Mecca of apostasy. And there is Jerusalem, which is the city of peace. 
Jerusalem means city of peace. And in Jerusalem, we found my, Mount Zion. That's where that is. And so when the Bible here is saying that the winepress is trodden without the city, the treading of the winepress represents the judgment. Okay, that's what the treading of the winepress is. That's the judgment, and that's going on outside of the city. Outside of the city. Meaning that God's people during the seven last plagues will not be touched. They will not die, but they will declare the glory of the Lord. They will not die. So if we make it in that number by the grace of God, we will not die. We can face it and know that we will see tomorrow. They will not die. You could just write down Psalm chapter 91 and read the whole of Psalm chapter 91 because therein, therein it shows very clearly throughout that whole entire chapter that God's people will not be touched. They will not be hurt. They will not be afraid of the terror by night nor the hour that flieth by day. I jump down to verse 7. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come near thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold, the reward, behold and see the reward of the wicked. So, verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. So they will not be touched by the seven last plagues. Why? Because the winepress is trodden without, outside of the city. This is not speaking about the literal uh, Jerusalem and Babylon. It's not talking about that. It's speaking of spiritual Babylon, spiritual Jerusalem. So Jerusalem, spiritual, God's people will not be touched. They will not be hurt. The Bible lets us know that. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So they shall not hurt nor destroy my holy mountain. The holy mountain will not be hurt nor destroyed. Who is on the holy mountain? Revelation 14 and verse 1. Revelation 14 and verse 1. And lo, I saw a lamb that stood on the Mount Sion. That's the holy mountain. And who's with the Lamb? The 140 and 4,000 who represent the fifth and the sixth angel. So they will not be hurt. They will not be touched. They will not be hurt. They will not be touched at all. But in that day, as in the time of Jerusalem's destruction, God's people will be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written among the living. God's people are going to be kept safe. They will not be touched. They will not be touched. And these are the texts right here that you could write down for your sake. Um, and this is the final slide, in fact. These texts you could jot down that will help for you to solidify that fact. Because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, right? So you have a few witnesses right over here. You have Isaiah and Joel. I like what Joel says. He says, in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be what? Deliverance. As the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Whom the Lord shall call. So God's people will be kept in safety. God's people will be kept in safety. So that is our sweep of Revelation chapter 14. We did not go into the seventh angel. Don't have the time to go into the seventh angel. Tomorrow we're going to look at the seven churches to zero into our work right now. We saw the sweep of past present and future so we see what's getting ready to come we learn from history and now we're going to focus in from here on we're going to focus in our work the time that we are in right now and the work that god expects from us right now the seventh angel you can look into that more thoroughly yourself we do have a study online entitled the seventh angel and the seventh angel represents The saints who experience the special resurrection. And in our study online, you can see it online because I don't have the time to go through it with you here. But it represents the saints from the special resurrection. When the Lord was teaching this thing, it is so solid, it is undeniable. And I have to be honest with you guys, it is kind of 
we, I mean, like, here it is God that is leading this, so there's no fear. But when we're home studying or whatever and we're seeing these things, that spirit, that, I can understand what William Miller was going through. To study these things, and it's like, wait a minute, how am I supposed to share that with other people? To say that, like, who says that? How do you come to the conclusion that the seventh angel represents the special resurrection saints, but the Bible lays it out in a way that I cannot deny, so I can't but tell you that is fact. And so, if you take a look at our study online, then you'll see how it is broken down that this represents the special resurrection saints, the seventh angel, because the seventh angel comes out of the altar. So when you study that, then you'll see and properly comprehend, what was that? Oh yeah, Hebrews, Daniel. Oh. So, so the seventh angel represents the special resurrection saint. Why? Because in Revelation chapter 14, there's that text uh, in verse 13 where it says that in verse, I'm closing right here, I'm closing right here, I'm closing right here. I'm sorry, guys. I I'm sorry, but this is the word of God. This is the word of God. In verse 13, it says, And I heard the voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead. Blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth, meaning from this point on. Blessed are those saints from this point on, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Their works follow them. So blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. So, 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 so the reason why it's saying that right there from henceforth, from henceforth is speaking from the point of the third angel's message. So all those that died under the third angel's movement and on, they will experience this special resurrection. It is those people, their works do follow them. Those people were preaching the second coming of Jesus. And so they experience the special resurrection in order that they can see the one whom they were preaching about all along. They are blessed to be able to see the man who they were preaching about all along. And so that is why it says that they are blessed and that they may rest and their labors do follow them. Their, their works does follow them. So we are closed here for this class. We saw the sweep, Revelation chapter 14. And now from here on, we will zoom in. We will zoom into our, from where we are and our work from here. We have a beautiful work to do. And to see what's getting ready to come, I want to be in that number that will vindicate the character of God, have the glory of Jesus so thoroughly and perfectly reproduced in them. I want to be in that number. How about you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the truth as it is in Christ. We thank you for the distinct utterances of Revelation chapter 14. We know that there's much more for us to study, much more for us to grasp. But that which you have given us even now, we thank you for it. We ask that you may continue to increase, increase our understanding and our learning, that we may continue to grasp these things, so that in knowing the time, and that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, we would do that and get to work. We realize that the night is far spent. We realize that night cometh where no man can work. But you are the light of our life. You are giving us light to work within this 11th hour that we may take hold of the work and press on the upward way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.